so an outline of what I'm going to talk about today, I'd like to spend a little time talking about etiological models of pediatric obesity and from there go into comorbidity and use that as a foundation for discussing treatment implications. And then from there go into some of my current research that I would hope to bring here and then discuss um, some funding opportunities and a future research agenda. So in terms of the prevalence of pediatric obesity, approximately 32% of children and adolescents in the United States are overweight or obese. And while rates have nearly tripled since 1980, the rates have been fairly steady since the 2003-2004 surveys. Um, the only significant difference was a decline in the prevalence of overweight and obesity among the, age, uh, the two to five year old age group. Um, so that's encouraging, but we're talking a, a, small, a small decline. There are also significant racial and ethnic disparities in pediatric obesity, uh, particularly among non-Hispanic black and Hispanic youth having disproportionately high rates. There are also so, uh, significant socioeconomic disparities with children from the lower socioeconomic strata more severely um, impacted. One area of concern is that of severe obesity where the prevalence seems to be actually increasing. And this has traditionally been defined as obesity greater than or equal to the 99th percentile. Um, Catherine Flegel has recently suggested that we change that definition. <laughs> Um, when we look at the um, normed percentiles, the data only go up to the 97th percentile. And so what she suggested is that we use a metric of 120% of the 95th percentile, which maps onto the growth chart data pretty well. So it's a new metric you'll probably be seeing in the literature more frequently. Um, she also suggested maybe using an absolute BMI cutoff of 35 uh, or greater. Um, typically, the 120% of the 95th is a slightly lower threshold than the absolute one. Severe of obesity across surveys affects between 4 and 6% of children, and they have significantly higher so psychosocial and medical comorbidities than obese children. And according to Wise and colleagues, up to 50% have what's called the metabolic syndrome or a clustering of risk factors. So that includes hypertension, um, lipid dysregulation. Um, and or glu impaired glucose tolerance. So this is a particular group at, at high risk. One of the core models for conceptualizing the etiology and treatment of pediatric obesity is the bioecological mm -hmm. model. And so it supports the child-centered treatment of children within the context of the family and the community. Um, it promotes a balanced, non-judgmental, multidisciplinary weight management approach. Um, it's been used to support multisystemic therapy approaches and also home-based interventions, and it emphasizes the role of the environment. So the basic model was designed by Bronfenbrenner back in 1979 and guided much of the early research in this area, placing the child in the context of the parents, the peers, and the greater community. Um, over the years, this model has undergone significant uh, revisions, and I'll show you just a couple of those. Um, one here is by Deborah Newmark Stainer. And so you'll notice that in the middle we have weight related issues. And once again, we have the individual. So not limited to children, but factors such as age, gender, race, ethnicity, um, loss of control, eating, um, appetitive uh, uh, differences, the role of the family, the role of the child's peer group. And then you'll notice that instead of community, we have three layers. Um, so schools and institutions, institutions might include like daycare centers um, or other um, after school programming, community factors, this would be things like access to parks, recreation, neighborhood safety, and then greater societal level factors in terms of like what are body image norms and ideals, what are our si ideas about portion sizes, um, gender, gender role norms, expectations regarding eating at significant uh, social events, holidays, um, cultural events. In another rendition of this model um, conducted um, by Tabachi, we get rid of the concentric circles and really this model emphasizes the interaction between genetics and the environment which were missing from the previous two models. So introducing the role of gender, um, the role of race which could be um, in terms of body image ideals and also getting at uh, some of those disparities that I mentioned genes modulating adiposity, as, as well as the role of the environment in terms of geographic region, um, cultural and religious factors, family factors, and societal factors. 
The model that has perhaps the greatest support currently is known as the six C's model by Harrison. And once again, this is one of those concentric circle models, but if I put it up here, it's really complex and your eyes would probably glaze over or you'd be really struggling to read it because it's, it would be so small um, to get the whole model. But the six C's are cellular factors, including mm. genetic and biological factors, child factors, including personal and behavioral characteristics, um, clan here refers to the community, um, so family care, or sorry, to the family, so family characteristics, I jumped ahead. Um, community, the child's social world outside of the home. Um, country, so looking at state and national level institutions. And then finally, culture, including societal level factors. So just to give you a few select examples, I could probably spend a couple of hours talking just about comorbidities and etiology. So, um, I may not cover everything with which you're familiar. At the cellular sphere, um, genetics contribute anywhere between 30% and 77% of our weight. Um, also, they control things such as areas of fat deposition, the nature and type of fat, brown fat, white fat. Also, we have the role of um, different viruses. Um, one that our research team looked at was the 8036 virus, and it seems to be associated with both pediatric and adult overweight and obesity. Um, however, it's also associated with a better um, cardiometabolic risk, uh, risk uh, profile. And so what we did is we looked at children who tested positive and who tested negative for exposure, and then put them in a weight, um, a weight management program to see if there's a differential weight loss. Um, over the course of four weeks, the children, who, on average, or the children who tested negative lost about 15 pounds. The children who tested positive lost 14 pounds. Significant? Probably not. <laughs> um, but it was worth, worth a shot. So I have a question mark. There, there's something going on with this, I, you know, whether mm -hmm. it pertends to obesity, I'm not sure. Um, and there's certainly something in terms of lipid regulation going on. In terms of the child sphere, we have self-regulation. Children who have problems with self-regulation in kindergarten tend to have higher BMIs by the time they reach middle school. Um, we also know that media exposure plays a role, and there are different mechanisms by which it, it, it could play a role. We think, um, at least the, the mechanism with the most evidence is th uh, via food-related advertising. And that tends to increase um, appetitive priming, so children are more hungry, and they tend to make poorer food choices and eat more food after they've watched um, television um, with food-related advertisements. Um, there seems to be a cyclical relationship between pediatric obesity and sleep. So children with poor sleep tend to gain more weight than those with good sleep. And then also children who do become overweight or obese often have comorbidities that interfere with their ab ability to sleep. So we see that cyclical relationship. And then certain medications that children might need to be on for a variety of reasons contribute. In terms of the family sphere, we have maternal education, lower education, poor nutritional choices, um, and maternal mental health. Um, mothers who are dealing with their own mental health issues tend to have less time to supervise their children or to engage in their child's behavior because they have concerns of their own. Um, overeating and smoking during pregnancy, non-breastfeeding, um, parental dietary intake, so not only modeling, um, and serving of different portion sizes, but we even know that breast milk is, tends to be flavored by the diet of the mother, and that children, even as young as two years old, have a preference for the diet of their mothers, which is pretty interesting. Feeding strategies. Um, mothers who have um, struggled with their own weight um, oftentimes will be following strict diets or do, do things that are helping them control their own weight. And typically, children come you know, with a good sense of satiety and hunger. They know when they're hungry, they, they know when they're not. And when they get put on forced feeding schedules, it ruins that sense of satiety and hunger, and they often end up eating more. So having those re rigid feeding strategies can be an issue, aside from choices that are made in, inside the family. Um, the quality and quantity of family meal times. Some of the research su suggests that it's not just eating a family meal together, but the ability to have a family meal together suggests something about the atmosphere of the family or investment in the family, the ability to have the time to sit down together, to talk with each other. And it goes along with this last one in terms of conflict and chaos. <coughs> if a family you know, has that time to take an interest in their children, 
um, versus a family where things are so chaotic, it's like, where are your kids right now? Well, I'm not sure. I think they're at so-and-so's house or I, you know, kind of running around frantically trying to get everything done. Um, that tends to portend to childhood obesity. So the two tend to go together. And I think one, one thing interesting when I was putting the slide together, these are all factors that are empirically supported uh, in the literature. There's a conspicuous absence of fathers, and there's a cons cons uh, conspicuous uh, absence of other caregivers. Um, so, you know, what about aunts, uncles, grandparents, <laughs> after school, daycare? Not in here. Um, um, so daycare is under, actually, under, but fathers were absent, but under the community sphere, 75% of U.S. preschool children are involved in non-parental daycare. And so this is a huge source of influence on their diets, and the states vary in terms of their rules and regulations regarding what can be fed, how much can be fed, et cetera. Um, need to look at school meal programs, which vary uh, as well. Um, particularly uh, private schools are untouched. Um, so there might be federal regulations in, in terms of public schools, but what do you do when you go to a private school? Peer networks um, have two uh, areas of influence. One is food and activity choices. We know there tends to be a clustering among children, so they tend to eat what their peers eat. They tend to do what their peers do. Um, and so we actually see these obesity networks forming. And then also social marginalization of children. It's bi-directional. Children with weight issues tend to be more marginalized, so they're less likely to participate in the activities of their peers, um, oftentimes not participating in physical activity. But also kids who may be a little shy to begin with will kind of self-select out and miss out for some of those opportunities as well, which may increase their risks of pediatric obesity. So kind of a bi-directional mechanism. And then finally, neighborhoods, factors such as the availability of different food <coughs> choices, safety, parks, recs. Um, in terms of the country level factors, we have uh, the economic recession, so trying to get um, cheaper foods that may be of poor nutritional quality. Um, looking at various state policies, um, Arkansas uh, had an act uh, 1220, which actually limited um, the contracts that schools could have with outside vendors in terms of the provision of foods um, to extracurricular events. Um, so that was a, an interesting approach. I, I'm not sure if we need to limit vendors as much as maybe have quality control in terms of those vendors and what they um, have to offer. But that, that's been offered as an exemplar. And in terms of culture, looking at our ideas of portion size, which have increased significantly over time. Um, looking at advertising and the creation of norms. Um, you know, if you watch TV, the vast majority of uh, advertisements are for food. Yet at the same time, there's this quote unquote thin ideal. And it's like, well, how do you do that? <laughs> um, my, my mentor used to always say tongue in cheek. It's like, well, you know, one of my areas is bulimia and uh, the on, that's the only answer. Eat everything and stay thin. <laughs> and it's like, oh dear, <laughs> that's not a good message to be sending. And then looking at different body image ideals. Um, different cultural groups have different body, body size ideals, also ideals in terms of how weight is carried. Um, so that plays a role in terms of do I need to be worried about my child? Do I not need to be worried? At what point would I be worried? And then how do you tap into uh, and reach different cultural groups in terms of communicating the seriousness of, of this problem? And then finally, all these areas interact uh, together. So this is Harrison's model. We went through the circles. Um, they're then cross-sected uh, cross by dimension. So one is the six C's that we just went through. Dimension number two organizes the model mm -hmm. into eating, exercise, and person-specific characteristics that influence weight. So you know, eating, dietary choices, portion size, et cetera, um, physical activity choices. Person-specific characteristics can be things like impulsivity, loss of control eating, emotional reactivity, uh, motivation, things that aren't traditionally discussed, um, at least in, in maybe the medical side of the pediatric literature. Uh, dimension three looks at that contrast between what one does and the opportunities and resources available for doing it. So you know, maybe your desire to engage in physical activity and noting that maybe you don't have the resources, the time, the facilities, and kind of that push-pull, um, because certainly if you build um, you know, a, a certain public desire for something, then it gets built. But until that desire is there, it's not there. 
It's looking at that push-pull. And then dimension four is the interaction of proximal and distal factors. So at the center, you know, we had the cell and then the child. So it kind of ignores the cell part. But, you know, the child is, can I have that? Can I have that? Can I have that? Which influences parents in terms of the, <laughs> the choices they make for their kids. But also some of those more external or distal factors, such as the economy, um, one's job, one's socioeconomic status, put constraints on the opportunities. Can I enroll my child in summer camp? Can I, you know, get my child swim lessons? Things like that. And so this, these dimensions collectively divide the model into a variety of zones, which I won't go into. I think that's <laughs> pretty comprehensive. So switching gears just for a moment to the complications of pediatric overweight and obesity. In terms of the medical side, we have type 2 diabetes, high blood fats, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, asthma and bre breathing problems, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, sleep disorders, orthopedic problems, early puberty, which can stunt growth and bring on certain social issues prematurely that children may not be ready to handle, um, cancer, uh, certain types typically more in the reproductive realm, GERD, um, gallbladder disease, and then um, health-related quality of life. In terms of our psychosocial complications, um, actually, for the psychological complications, the relationships range between small to moderate in terms of effect size, um, but we see body dissatisfaction, low self-esteem, symptoms of depression, loss of control eating, and unhealthy weight control behaviors. And in the case of depression, it's kind of interesting. Most of the research literature suggests that pe uh, pediatric depression leads to an overweight status, and very little literature supports the opposite <coughs> relationship. Um, it's quite rare. In terms of social um, impairments, we see impaired social relationships. Um, children inc uh, incur teasing, bias, and stigma. And then later, particularly in the high school ages, we see reduced educational and then later occupational achievement. Um, I wrote quality of life again because there's also psychological, qual psychological quality of life. There's also sh social quality of life, so different types uh, there. Um, this is a pediatric adjustment model that <coughs> depicts the association between the degree of overweight among kids and then their psychosocial adjustment and some of the factors that might moderate or influence that relationship. So we ha have things such as demographics. This relationship tends to be stronger as one moves from childhood into adolescence. Um, it also tends to be stronger among groups that favor a thinner physique and weaker among groups that favor a larger physique. So it tends to be stronger among Caucasians and Asians, and it tends to be weaker among Hispanics and African Americans. And then the relationship also tends to be stronger among persons of higher SES and weaker among persons with lower SES. But you'll notice there's a lot of things that influence this that may intersect there. Um, children that incur um, stigma, bias, teasing, and bullying, um, this relationship is particularly strong. And we know that children that are teased are three times more likely to have poor psychosocial adjustment than children that aren't teased. Um, maternal mental health, again, um, strengthens this degree of association. Um, no one has looked at paternal or family mental health, which is kind of interesting. And I think there are also some other candidates um, here that could be considered as well. So a few illustrative studies um, of this relationship. This is one that our group uh, did we investigated the association between adolescent overweight and obesity, indices of peer and family support and their interaction in the use of unhealthy weight control behaviors. And so for this one, we used the health behavior in school-aged children um, collaborative <coughs> survey, um, used ninth and 10th grades here, um, so 4,598 children. And just uh, an aside, we chose uh, these two grades because uh, they were asked the questions in which we were interested. Not all grades were asked the same <coughs> questions. So one question of interest was, um, what types of behaviors do the kids in the survey engage in in order to control or to lose weight? And in this slide, I have the healthy, quote unquote, um, weight control behaviors. And we see in terms of exercise, uh, about 83% <coughs> of girls and boys drink more water, uh, about 64% of boys, 75% of girls eat fewer sweets, about 48 and 66%, eat more fruits and vegetables, about 49% and 61%, eat less fat, 42%, 61%, eat 
eat less, about 31% and 58%, drink fewer soft drinks, 39 and 56%, that message is getting out there. And then dieting under professional supervision, uh, about 3% of boys and between 4 and 5% of girls. What was concerning is that they also endorsed engaging in a number of unhealthy weight control behaviors. And so here, first column, um, I have the percentage of boys and then the percentage of girls. So between 23 and 24% of boys said that they would skip meals to lose or control their weight. 47% um, of girls, that's a really high number. Um, fasting, between 7 and 8% of boys, 16% of girls. Um, restricting their diet to one or more food groups, uh, about 8% of boys, 13% of girls. Using diet pills and laxatives, <coughs> about 4% of boys, 9% of girls. Um, smoking more, so not smoking for recreational purposes was part of the question. Um, it's almost 4% of boys and 9% of girls. Um, vomiting. 2% of boys and almost 5% of girls. And then looking collectively, what proportion endorsed one or more of these behaviors? So about almost a third of the boys and a little over half of the girls. Um, so you see that confluence of disordered eating and obesity coming together. Um, possible disordered eating was defined as the, pro um, you had to endorse body dissatisfaction um, coupled with either vomiting, laxatives, or fasting. And so that applied to almost 5% of the boys and 15% of the girls. So those are numbers were really concerning. And then among overweight uh, boys, they were 1.7 times more likely to engage in these behaviors. And obese boys were almost three and a half times more likely to engage in these behaviors. Um, overweight <coughs> girls, uh, 2.4 times more likely. And obese girls, 3.8 times more likely. <coughs> Um, other predictors of unhealthy weight control behaviors for both sexes included difficult communication with parents and caregivers, which kind of maps onto that chaos and family communication that we saw in the etiological model. Um, low levels of parent school support, once again, that ability to be interested and invested in one's kids. And then, um, as before, frequent bullying uh, were the big three that showed up. Um, some of our conclusions, uh, one that I wanted to emphasize, was that adolescents are at high risk of using unhealthy weight control behaviors and would benefit from interventions for increasing their knowledge and support for achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. Um, they were pretty clueless in terms of how to take care of themselves. Um, this is a, a slide from Deborah Newmark Stainer that shows the relationship between pediatric obesity and the development of disordered eating. And so we have, from left to right, weight control practices, physical activity behaviors, body image, eating behaviors, and weight status. And as we go down the chart, we see the progression from, quote unquote, more normative eating to more disordered eating. So in the first line, we have healthy eating, moderate physical activity, body acceptance, um, regular eating, and then healthy body weight. Once we get into the dieting realm, um, with kids, we see minimal or excessive physical activity. Um, sometimes when they're dieting, they lack the energy to engage, or these are kids that already perceive themselves as, um, the next col column is mild, mild body dissatisfaction, so they're kind of embarrassed to be out there or among their peers. Um, sometimes they engage in excessive physical activity to try and lose weight. And then we see this erratic eating. It's like, yeah, I'm trying not to eat. I'm trying to, quote unquote, be good, skip breakfast, skip lunch, and then they get kind of hungry later and like eat more than they wanted to. And you see this really erratic pattern, which disrupts those natural sensations of hunger and satiety. Um, and you often see uh, children who are mildly underweight or mildly overweight. The next level, we have unhealthy weight control, um, mm -hmm. lack of or obsessive physical activity, moderate uh, body dissatisfaction, um, the binge eating, um, it can grow into that, and then you have children who are over or underweight. And then the last uh, row, um, you can see the development of anorexia, bulimia, or other disordered eating. Um, there's the term uh, anorexia athletica, um, an eating disorder characterized by excessive or inappropriate exercise, like exercising when injured, ill, going for a run in a thunderstorm, risk of getting struck by lightning. Not a good idea. Body dissatisfaction, um, oftentimes binge eating disorder, and then severe under or overweight. 
And one thing that's really interesting in terms of treating disordered eating, the very first intervention that we implement is regular eating, eating on a set schedule every day to help restore the sensations of uh, satiety and, and hunger and to help regulate that. It also helps regulate blood sugar, mood, etc. And it's interesting for a lot of college students that in and of itself is enough of an intervention to, to um, mitigate a budding eating disorder. Um, a few other illustrative studies, uh, Denise Wilfley et al. Uh, has this wonderful program. Um, she looked at family-based maintenance approaches to childhood weight loss in children ages 7 to 12 who had had at least one overweight parent. So first in the program, they all undergo weight loss, and then they go on two types of weight maintenance. Um, if you were at the talk yesterday uh, by Dr. Hill, he said, you know, yeah, we can help people lose weight, but then how do we help them maintain that weight loss and identify that as a significant problem? <coughs> Um, she used two approaches to weight loss maintenance in, in, in these kids. Um, one was behavioral skills, so things like modeling, um, contingency management, portion sizes, all your you know, traditional stuff. As a little bit of a foil, she developed this social facilitation maintenance in terms of helping children cope with teasing, interventions in the schools, um, helping them make friends, arranging for play dates, helping them meet peers with similar interests, a little bit of social engineering. This, those kids actually maintained the weight loss a little bit better, um, which really, I think, goes back to that model I showed before in terms of the psychosocial comorbidities. You're ameliorating those, which really helps kids feel better about themselves. Um, which goes into the next study. Um, there's been a lot in the news uh, recently um, I think some, I forget the name right off, the, off the top of my head, but was saying that people, you know, should be shamed into, you know, somehow losing weight and taking care of themselves. And it's like, are you kidding me? Um, Sutton and Terciano um, had this wonderful four-year study. They looked at per persons who experienced weight discrimination were two and a half times more likely to become obese. And our friends over in the social sciences can tell us that when people are shamed, criticized, they lose that sense of self-efficacy. They lose that sense of energy. They become depressed. It's like, well, why invest in myself? So it, it actually makes it harder to lose weight. So that was a, an important piece of information that builds on the pediatric side perfectly in terms of bias and stigma. Um, the Journal of Pediatric Psychology had a wonderful special issue in 2013 where they highlighted nine state-of-the-art pediatric obesity interventions. And then looked across those nine studies to say, you know, what lessons have we learned or not learned? Um, and I'll save some of those for the next slide. But if you haven't seen that, that special issue, it's, it's definitely worth looking at. So some of the treatment implications. Um, well, maybe, maybe I'll go back to one. Um, just in terms of this one thing they didn't look at, um, or that they did look at, a lot of the control groups in the studies did really well. Um, and it was things like patient-physician relationships. Um, if there was a really good relationship, particularly with pediatricians, the kids did better, even if it wasn't like an active weight loss intervention, which was really fascinating. Um, family communication and family structure. Um, you know, people were doing a really poor, they, there was kind of this assumption that everybody has, you know, uh, you know mom, dad, kids. You know, there, there was never, you know, what do we do for non-traditional families? Not included. Um, so very important areas for future investigation. So some treatment implications. I've included the role of the physician, but I think this is very well defined in terms of the American Academy of Pediatrics Expert Committee recommendations. But going from these models, I think they tell us a lot about our professional communication. One is recognizing the child in context. So you know, when you see an overweight child or who has a weight problem, um, it may have Nothing or something to do with it, what the child's doing. You have to look at the child's family, peers, school, community. Um, and I, I think this goes along with the last one I'll skip to, um, perceptions in terms of their caregivers. So when someone's coming to you, this may be a family that's been working really hard on weight loss and has maybe already achieved significant gains, and suddenly you're saying, oh, you need to lose weight. Slap in the face. Um, this may be a family that's tried really hard and not been successful, and they're just really frustrated. Or it could be a family that's like, my child's fine. I want my child to be large. You know, my child's well-fed and healthy, and may, you know, may not share this perception. So 
it really suggests the importance of paying attention to these factors and meeting people where they're at in terms of identifying interventions. You know, it's not like you can just say, oh, here's an intervention for you. The family might be like, we don't need that. You know, why, why would I, you may have to you know, start in terms of understanding how they feel and what their perspective is. Um, being sensitive to issues of body image um, among children. A lot of times we, we emphasize girls, but most of the measures of body image were designed for girls and not for boys, so they may not pick up on body image disturbances. So having things, you know, in, in terms of pediatric practice, having appropriate sized gowns, tables, chairs, um, even things like parking um, can be very important. Um, I think I already kind of hit on assumptions regarding children and caregivers, having a little more compassion for the systems in which they reside. In terms of settings, we need to address overweight and obesity in places where family and children reside. It's great to come into primary care and have a visit, but how realistic is it you know, to take one's child out of school for a special appointment and to go in there for some type of weight management program once a week or really with everything going on once a month? Probably not. So we really need to get away from some of those interventions and use our pediatricians to identify, assess, and refer to appropriate community support mechanisms. Um, the assessment uh, interventions, we need to have that basic level of assessment, um, not only in terms of the medical comorbidities, but even looking at the psychosocial. Um, you know, brief measures like size me up or size them up will give you a, a good, they're like 22 items. You know, we'll give you a quick look at some of the issues that the child is facing. Um, looking at, you know, how does the, you know, what, what, what is the family's context? What are their perceptions of what is an ideal body size, portion sizes? Is this important to them? Um, why might it be important to them? So that the message can be tailored to the family. Interventions themselves must be multi-systemic. Just focusing on the child or just focusing on one location is unlikely in this broader context to have a significant effect. Although some messages, you know, when you're in one of the, you know, one piece of that pie or one piece of the circle, sometimes just clear, consistent messages delivered across all those concentric circles can be important. Um, interventions may need to address issues of body image, self-efficacy, out-of-control eating, teasing, and also our interventions need to include fathers and other caretakers um, who have been conspicuously absent and then looking beyond obesity in terms of the health of kids, um, teaching them self-care, um, having, you know, teaching them like how to cook, how to eat, the importance of physical activity, managing stress, uh, gesundheit and things that contribute to this. Um, in terms of looking at our schools, um, I think bullying's got a lot of attention in recent years, which I'm really glad to see. Um, however, weight-related teasing, I don't think it's gotten quite that same level of attention. Um, looking at the school curriculum um, in terms of nutrition classes, you know, teaching children about appropriate health care, after school programming, uh, meals, vending and event contracts, um, even fundraising activities. Ooh, let's have a cupcake sale. Um, I already mentioned the state of Arkansas, um, but I think different state initiatives could be used in terms of um, regulating the, the quality of the food that's provided. In terms of societal level changes, changing perceptions and using that tailored health messaging to reach different groups of people so that this becomes a, a national priority. And then looking at combinations of interventions <coughs> across different levels. Look, oh, come back here. So in terms of future field directions, um, some of the conversations I've had, um, NHLBI, um, is really sponsoring work in terms of multi-systemic and multi-level models. And they have what are now um, called the COPTER trials. Um, so childhood obesity prevention and treatment research. Um, so they have two obesity prevention and two obesity multi-level randomized trials being conducted at Vanderbilt, Stanford, the University of Minnesota, and Case Western Reserve. And so these are considered state-of-the-art interventions that they're highly encouraging in terms of future intervention research. Similarly, the Centers for Disease Control have the CORD projects, um, the Childhood Obesity Research Demonstration projects, and these are four year, well, collectively a four-year project to improve children's nutrition and physical activity behaviors in the places where they live, learn, and play. 
And these are currently being conducted at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center, San Diego State, the Massachusetts uh, State Department of Public Health, and the University of Houston. Another target priority area is severe obesity. Um, that's why I had that prevalence slide at the beginning. And uh, there is a recent position pa uh, paper by the American Heart Association. Um, I forget her first name, Kelly was the first author. And these were some of the things that they called for in terms of federal funding. So development of a continuing or chronic care model for severe pediatric obesity. Um, the conduct and keeping of a longitudinal data uh, that tracks severe obesity and long-term outcomes. Um, improved early identification um, of children who are at risk for severe pediatric obesity, so the use of early life weight gain trajectory data. Um, intensive programming, particularly for younger children under the age of two or under the age of five. And then characterization of the origins of severe obesity. <coughs> they also called for evaluation of approaches such as meal replacement and very low calorie diets. I had some mixed, giving, uh, mixed feelings about that. Um, that might help children lose weight, but again, you're taking them out of that context and you're putting them in this artificial um, weight loss program. And so I think you're going to really need to couple that maybe with these weight management programs that target the child in their context. Um, looking at the safety and efficacy of new pharmaceuticals, if anyone has questions on that, I do have um, a couple of supplementary <coughs> slides that show like what medications are currently available for kids and candidates uh, for uh, investigation. I'm looking at combinations of therapies. For example, um, these lifestyle interventions and pharmacotherapy have not been tried together. So why not? Um, sometimes the medications can make it a little easier to make these changes, um, get people over the hump. Um, the generation of additional safety and efficacy data in bariatric surgery, which is pretty scary. It is approved in the United States down to age 12, kind of, sort of. Um, yeah, I, sometimes younger kids. Um, and then looking at the outcomes, uh, the Ruin XY, the banding, and the biliopancreatic diversion um, have some pretty good data in kids, but there are some new approaches um, where there isn't any data. And so it, it's kind of a scary thing to think about in terms of adolescence, kind of a last ditch, what do we do um, type of thing. And then the evaluation of serial interventions. What if we did this intervention between ages two and five, this intervention between the ages of, of five and eight, and what might that look like? Um, kind of a stepped care model even, um, but that hasn't been done. Um, so just segueing a little bit um, to talk a little bit about my uh, current, wor uh, current work. Um, one study that I I uh, gave to one of my doctoral students to conduct is looking at the effects of weight loss and weight bias and internalization of weight bias among adolescents. Um, so there's, there's weight bias, but when one internalizes it, you get this self-critiquing that occurs and kind of this buy-in into I'm no good, I can't do it, why try? It's very damaging to oneself. And so is weight loss enough to counteract those effects or do we also need psych services on top of that? Um, I'm working on a National Eating Disorder Recovery website. <clears throat> um, this would parallel the na National Weight Loss Registry, but it'd be a registry of persons who have recovered from eating disorders um, so that we could study what helped them recover and what is helping them maintain the recovery, as well as being able to post stories of success um, for persons who may be struggling with eating disorders, their friends and families, so that they can see, wow, people do recover from this and there is hope. Um, looking at the role of evaluative anxiety and self-focused attention on mentalizing and disordered eating. Um, so this is the role of um, mentalizing is the ability to recognize emotional um, uh, expressions and feelings in others. So it may be just from a facial expression or it could be in a social situation. How well are you reading other people? We know in eating disorders there tends to be a negative bias. Um, and sometimes also an anger bias. People are more likely to assume that other people are angry. And this could be easily translated into obesity research. Um, you know, is that evaluative anxiety you know, translated into a tendency um, to misperceive the expressions of others as being critical to, to oneself or maybe in promoting depression among certain persons with obesity? Um, extending models of eating disorder development, so Eric Stice's model, um, also Chris Fairburn's model. Um, the two 
core components of both models are a preoccupation with overweight, um, so a preoccupation with, in the role of one's weight, and then also body dissatisfaction, which go along with pediatric obesity. Um, and then I, I also was looking at the role of stand-up desks in improving health parameters. So that could be obesity, but it, it could also be energy metabolism, concentration, attention, um, general sense of well-being. Um, in terms of some future work, um, so in, in addition to maybe bringing that over, um, we have some really nifty brief interventions that haven't been well assessed. Um, in terms of uh, pediatricians, we have the 5210 model. Well thought out, clear, consistent health message. Um, five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, um, less than two hours of screen time, um, one hour of play, um, i.e. physical activity, <laughs> but play, and then um, zero sugar-sweetened beverages. And some of the pediatricians are telling me, I guess, where I visited yesterday, they're working on a 54321 model. It's like, okay, a lot of thought behind this, you know, nice, nice health message. Has it been empirically tested? No. It's like, oh, it would be fun to do. Um, also, some motivational interviewing approaches in terms of interacting with parents, it, that has not been tested. Um, so that'd be rel relatively easy to study to do. In terms of some partnerships, um, Kerbo Health developed this, there's an app for that, so <laughs> they developed this app um, for adults and adolescents. Um, so there's an adolescent app where kids can use their phones to like track what they eat and their activity and they can like upload it mm -hmm. to the center. And then they can also engage in like these web-based coaching uh, interactions with professionals who can kind of guide them in what they're doing and in their choices. And they also, I mean, they also get feedback on their phone, but you get that, you know, live component as well. Um, the program is based on some really nice, solid data, um, but it's not been empirically validated. No one's actually tested that, you know, the application of this data. So this would, you know, be great in terms of, of outreach, particularly in, in maybe more rural areas where it's harder to get in um, into a facility. So, you know, they're just looking for people to partner with. It's like over here. <laughs> Um, the Living Well Foundation, I'm on their board of directors. Um, we do um, outreach and health programming for children and adolescents mm -hmm. and their families. Um, the director is Jean Holsing. She's, she's got this wonderful um, program that they use in terms of uh, pediatric weight loss, but they also have adult boot camps that they run. Um, so it'd be really, you know, in terms of, you know, they already have a ready-made intervention. Um, it, it works. It's like, well, we could translate this to different populations. And then uh, building new collaborations, um, you know, looking in terms of what other people are doing. Um, a couple of funding mechanisms that looked interesting. Um, in terms of NIH, right now they have a call for home and family-based approaches for the prevention or management of overweight or obesity in early childhood. Um, our group has done some work in terms of um, family-based approaches, and so it might be really interesting to build on that research. Um, the National Science Foundation um, has a call for interdisciplinary uh, behavioral and social science research. Um, so maybe the role of stand-up desks or maybe um, going back to that Kerbal Health application. Um, I think there's some interesting opportunities there as well. Um, a few of the other funding agencies um, that fund research in this area, the Lawrence Foundation, the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, these are not the computer people. Um, these are the child health people, so no relation. Um, the Obesity Society, I'm a member of that, um, and they typically uh, give out uh, several grants per year, and then the Missouri Foundation for Health, among others. And which brings me to um, comments or questions, and thank you for, for listening to this. Hopefully I didn't bore you to tears. <laughs> Um, so it was developed um, by Jean Holsing and her husband in terms of um, combating pediatric obesity. And so they do health programming in the mm -hmm. school. So they'll deliver um, you know, talks, resources, and things on nutrition, physical activity, um, health screenings, et cetera. And then they also run Camp Jumpstart. 
So it's a summer camp for kids with severe obesity, so it's a teasing-free zone. Um, the whole camp is based on the idea that kids should have fun and enjoy summer camp. So they have like all these activities, but they're kind of tailored for kids that might have orthopedic issues and other problems so that they get to go canoeing, they get to go swimming um, in an atmosphere where they don't have to risk ostracism from their peers. And then they also go to classes that teach them about healthy living and nutrition without a focus on dieting because we're really concerned about instilling eating disorders. And typically over the course of a four week camp, the average weight loss is somewhere between 15 and 18 pounds. And typically over the eight week camp, it's upward of 30 pounds. Um, I actually have a few slides. Where is it located? Is it a national group? No, it's here local. Um, it's in Imperial, Missouri. And most of their program is in Jefferson County. And their funding comes from? Private donations. Um, so they've done really well. Um, what was the other thing about they have, them? Do they have a national draw of kids? Or is it uh, yeah, uh, yes. Um, they've had kids from all 50 states and several foreign countries. Um, anywhere between 70 and 100 kids per year attend. So um, I, I have some misgivings about kids, you know, going to camp to lose weight. But one thing that they really try, they like have parent day when they, they drop off the kids. They have parent day when they pick up the kids. And then they have this interactive website where they're trying to get the parents more integrated mm -hmm. and trying to share their program programming with the parents. Some parents are like, yeah, awesome. Other parents are like, here's my kid, bye. Um, so I, I think the intent is really good, but um, did, um, yeah, this was, um, this is a, one of the studies I did with them a, a few years back um, when we were looking at the 8036 virus, but the four week outcomes at that time, 15.7 uh, pounds weight lost, change in BMI, Zeke, C-score, BMI, systolic blood pressure, our eight-week outcomes. Um, these are probably our less impressive outcomes. Um, oftentimes, they're better. Um, so we had 76 campers who collectively lost 2,170 pounds. Um, One-mile run times um, uh, were reduced across campers by seven hours, 14 minutes, and seven seconds. So that was pretty um, exciting. Um, 70 of the kids were classified as obese at the beginning of camp and at the end. Uh, 59 uh, were classified. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, so they, I think they have a wonderful program that they've put together. Um, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, hunger do doesn't go away, though. No. no. How, how do they, I mean. Oh, it is, um, so their diet, yeah. um, their uh, nutritionist there has lost over 100 pounds. Um, she used to be a former camper and has kept it off now for several years. And so these kids eat a ton of food, but it's all like low fat, low cal, and like kid friendly. So everything's in like, you know, little bunches. Yeah. And, you know, instead of your carton of fries, you get your carton of carrots and other, you know, <clears throat> kid friendly stuff. It's like really colorful and comes with, you know, like, you know, carbo corn or, you know, just all sorts of interesting, you know, um, you know, they have all these catchphrases. But I mean, these kids are eating like these huge plates fulls of food, but so the. Yeah, because the, you know, the nutri nutritional quality is there, but with that reduced caloric load. So hunger tends not to be a problem so much. And then these kids are moving. Yeah, that's uh, what I'm thinking. Their hunger would be higher than it would be in the Yeah, at home. Yeah, um, it really hasn't been an issue. Um, I bring my doctoral students there every summer, and we do like programming in terms of, um, we, we run groups for kids that have uh, undergone loss. Um, we've done uh, groups for stress management, um, kids who have been abused, and so we'll, we'll take them aside and work with them because sometimes that's driving um, emotional eating and loss of control eating. Um, so we spend time down at the camp, and you know, part of being a tease-free zone, it's like you're not allowed to do your hair. Um, you know, you're supposed to wear you know like gym shorts, t-shirt untucked. You know, wear your nasty tennis shoes. You know, hat, ponytail. You know, so it's, it's kind of fun, you know, to go down there dressed like a complete slob and enjoy yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun, you know, um, you know, my students are, it's like, you know, they have to be dressed up for our outpatient clinic. And it's like, well, yeah, sorry, camp, no makeup, get rid of it, you know, keep something, you know, keep a bag in your trunk because you're gonna need to change. <laughs> so um, it's really cool. Yeah. I'm curious about the relationship between um, parent concern about a child's weight and the child's outcome <coughs> in um, any form of weight loss program. So I would assume that a little bit of concern is a good thing and a lot of concern might be 
counterproductive? Um, anytime a parent is invested and concerned, that's great. Because um, I see parents as partners, and it's like, wow, they're already on board. And so, you know, when parents are, are at that stage, you, know, you they're open to sharing resources. So even if it's high concern, it's just parents don't always know how to help their kids. So even parents that may have high concerns, you know, they might be weighing their kid or doing other inappropriate things, and it's like, you know, it's like, you know what? I understand this is really important to you, and you know, let's try these things instead. And they're usually like, oh, sure, whatever you say. You know, they're so motivated. So if parents are on board, that's you know, that's huge. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the different disciplines that you've worked with in the past and maybe other disciplines that you're interested in in the future that you have now? Just seeing there are a lot of people with different disciplines you so. I should have asked you guys where you're from. <laughs> um, absolutely. So, um, you know, psychology, because that's my home discipline. Um, I've also done a lot of research in, over in terms of medicine. Um, I even had a, a pharmacological study where I had a study physician on board. Um, exer exercise and um, physiology um, with the stand-up desks. So I had um, an exercise physiologist with a background in nutrition and, and dietetics on board, so that worked really well. Um, did an 80-36 study uh, with an MD with a background in virology. So um, yeah, various uh, disciplines. I also did, um, okay, I forget how many, but I did a number of feeding studies. And so we had a couple of dietitians on board working with a metabolic kitchen. So um, we were one of the people that looked at the Kashi going slamming system. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I'm really open to interdisciplinary collaborations. And also, um, you know, if people have other ideas, I'm not wedded to my own ideas. Um, I, yeah, other ideas are highly welcome. Yes. And we're so far as a society from having consensus on, yes. on the what of, of what people are eating. Um, and our public policy is clearly devoted to subsidizing row crops and not vegetables and things like that. And we have a long history of highly variable response to low fat in yeah. the terms. Um, and uh, so I, I guess I wanted to know your thoughts on if you think we're ever going to get to the what <laughs> to provide any kind of universal recommendations, or are there new ways for people to approach this issue and, and, and many prescriptions that you would offer to a family and support them in implementing? Yeah, I, I think that's going to be incredibly hard to do in terms of a, any type of prescription, but I, I think a couple of things that would go a long way toward helping. Um, one is if we can get the message out that this is important. It'd be really fun to partner with business and marketing to get them to market. What if there was a McDonald's of healthy foods? So you could go in and you could get like this perfectly, you know, nutritionally balanced breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, instead of, you know, I, I think at the, the lecture yesterday, Dr. Hill was like, well, you know, we'll just have women, you know, stay home, ha, 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 and, and make, make food. It's like, yeah, good one. Um, or maybe not. <laughs> and it's like, you know, what if, what if, you know, on your way to the soccer game, you could stop at a place where, you know, your, your kid could get something that was of even a higher quality than you could prepare? Whoa, you know, how cool would that be? Or what if kids learned about important nutrition and physical activity starting in the elementary schools? I mean, I, I work at St. Louis University. We have over 14,000 14, students. We have no meal plan on campus. The meal plan is you can go to Kdoba, you can, ooh, Subway, okay, <laughs> better. You can go to the burger place, you can go, but it's all fast food. Um, there are no health classes. Um, nothing is required as part of the core curriculum. Um, the school, I went to a private four-year college, and you all had to take Health 101. So it was a year-long class. You had someone from um, exercise. You had someone from nutrition. You had a psychologist, and they, they taught you all this stuff. And it was a required class as part of your core curriculum. At St. Louis University, not included. Nothing. Um, I've worked with some athletes there um, that survived via the vending machine. 
So I think if we can start and develop kind of this public health consciousness, I think it will grow um, a demand to supply these things. And I think if we start doing that versus saying, well, you have to do this, or I think the other thing that Hill suggested was having um, a default, um, having the healthy option being the default, and then have to, having to ask uh, for your French fries. I think those are going to go a lot further without people feeling like they're being manipulated or controlled.